I'm Jonathan Tran from Bystance, and today I'm going to talk about calimetry. So calimetry is a global tracing system for Kubernetes control plane. And so let me start with what is a tracing system? So a tracing system is of course a system of traces and each trace is a tree of spans. So what is a span? A span is a scope of processing with events attached to it. So one definition is a tracing system binds data to the life cycle of a single transactional object. But the question is how do we define a transactional object? For the conventional RPC architecture, you can see from the screenshot in this corner, it is an example screenshot from Yaga UI, which is an open source tracing, uh, tracing visualization tool. And we usually determine the RPC system's span hierarchy using the scopes between the synchronous RPC service call. So the caller service in the RPC architecture is the parent scope of the call service. But in terms of Kubernetes, what would fit the equivalent definition? If we reuse the same interaction from RPC system, a trace would be one API server request. But what is the significance of such an API server request? Turns out that an API server request just edits an object in the etcd object store of a Kubernetes cluster. And what can we, you can't really tell a lot from a single request. If we look at the bigger picture, the Kubernetes is actually an asynchronous choreography, and there is no central coordinator to tell the controllers what to do. And controllers would watch for object changes and perform reconciliations in response. And each reconciliation is an action that moves the system from the current state to the actual state, uh, to the desired state. And in this big system, each API server request is just a consequence of a reconciliation, which is a small step in the big picture of the entire feedback system formed by the controllers working together. So if this is a bit abstract, let's talk with an analogy. I would like to visualize the Kubernetes cluster as a pot of soup. So initially, this soup only has a few nodes. Then when we create a replica set in this soup, the replica set controller will observe this repli new replica set. Then in response, this replica set controller will add some new pods to the soup. And this pod alone just, just floats in the soup, but they do not do anything either. But there is a scheduler. The scheduler is like a spatula that will stir the pods and the nodes together. Then the pods will bind to the node. And this binding is then observed by the kubelet on the node. Then the kubelet will start running the container. Then when an eviction controller removes the pod from the soup, then the kubelet in response stops running the container. So what can we tell from this story? We can see that each component only knows about the input and output objects. So we do not know why each controller did something we only see the consequence of their decisions, which is the object updates. So for example, a replica set controller sees the number of nodes is less than the number of desired replicas, so it creates a pod. But is this, why is the number different? Is this caused by a deployment scaling or caused by pod eviction? Or did both events happen at the same time and the re replica set controller just happened to reconcile them in the same process? And if both happen at the same time, then what would be the parents, parents span above this scope? And there is no good answer to this. So turns out we cannot use this RPC approach to explain the causal hierarchy of this community system because there's no direct causal relationship between different objects. So the ultimate problem is the components have no knowledge about other components. They can only explain their own actions each component is its own island of data. And for example, the scheduler only knows that it scheduled a pod somewhere, and the deployment controller only knows that it updated a replica set. So without a global tracing system, we have to visit each of these islands and analyze the data component by component, which is a very laborious op operation. So how can we connect these isolated pieces of information together automatically? 
So let's look at what we know for sure. An operation on the same object, it would necessarily affect another operation on the, the, the second operation on the same object because it affects the inputs of the second reconciliation. For example, both components operating on this Nginx pod, they will affect each other, so we'll, they should be viewed in the same, the same trace. And on the other hand, operations on different objects, but if they are related, they should also, they will also affect each other. For example, both the pod and the deployment controllers reconciliation, both of them affect, are uh, related to the replica set Nginx. So they should be correlated as well. So this gives us a key idea. Can we connect the events based on the relationship of the objects that the event is for? So with the appreciation that we cannot and do not need to infer the causal relationship, we can simplify the problem a bit. The user story is, as a user who just wants to debug a problem, I want to see a sufficiently small sample of relevant and consecutive events, because events happening in a short period are most likely relevant. One update will trigger another controller to update. For example, the creation of the pod will immediately lead to the pod, pod binding event, because the scheduler reconciles in response to the pod creation event. And another example is, after the image is put successfully, the kubelet will respond to this updated image presence on the node, and it will start running the container. So this means events relevant to the same object on the same timeline provides a great deal of aid to troubleshooting. Now let's extend to multiple objects. Changes in one object may also result in objects on another object, and such objects also happen in a short period of time but as the relationship between two objects decays, the chance of them being relevant also reduces. So we can measure the relevance of objects as a separate dimension orthogonal to the horizontal timeline. So in terms of tracing, this means we have the horizontal axis, which is the time, and the vertical axis, which is the spans corresponding to the relevance between objects, where the span hierarchy implies how closely the objects are related. So in this example trace, the deployments are most closely related to the replica sets. So we can see that they are displayed vertically together, and the pods are also of the same pod are also displayed next to the replica set. And in this red square, uh, red rectangle, the first event in the deployment is a scaling event, and it triggers the scaling of the replica set, which then causes the creation of these two pods. And we can tell that they are related events based on the distance between these, of these events on the trace. So this determines the structure of visualization in calimetry. And now we will look at how calimetry fills up the traces with data. So the first question to consider is, what events do we actually want to see? First, we have the native Kubernetes events which are high-level abstract summarized by the components for the users. And they are, defined, they are designed to be user-friendly, which is why they show up in the kube control describe command. And looking at these commands can give us an impression of the entire flow of events. But these are just very high-level information. When something goes wrong or when the component is still under development and events are not comprehensive enough yet, then we want to get more information that can be collected automatically without the many work of requesting the specific information from the component development. So this leads to the second level, which is the object changes. The object changes are the interface of communication between components. So if something, we identify something is wrong, let's say in component B something is wrong, then component B must have read some object in the, in the API server where this object is different, and this difference is caused by another component A, which writes to this object. So if we just look at which objects are different, and we identify which object has, is writing to this object, uh, which controllers are writing to this object, then we can know that component A is the real source of the problem that caused the effective 
same time we notice incompetent B. So we can use this object changes to locate the exact problematic components. And once we have identified the problematic components, we would further drill down to the component logs. These are the low level details of logic within the component and with a very high amount of noise. And as I just mentioned, component logs, component logs do not know about the behavior of other components. So these logs only make sense after we know the input state from the object changes. So how do we collect object changes? In telemetry, this data comes from two sources, which are the audit log and the object list watch informers. The audit logs provide the metadata about a request, such as what object got, got changed, when did the change succeed, and who performed the change. And these are all very important information that are vital to identifying the cause of the problem, but it doesn't provide the most important information, which is what did the effect what did the request actually change? What are the fields that got modified? And this is why we need a second separate ListWatch event, uh, ListWatch client to tell us what data the request actually changed. So, which is consumed by the telemetry controller. So telemetry deploys two components. The controller component received the watch events from API server to compare the old and new objects and store the difference as the inside the uh, KV store. And this cache store using the objects and resource version as the key. And then the telemetry consumer will receive the audit events from the API server, and it will associate each audit event with the corresponding diff from the telemetry controller and format all the metadata as a span and then to send the trace to the send it to the trace collector. So this is for the object changes. And for the component logs, on the other hand, it has a much higher volume of data. So the required capacity of each component is much greater than the core control plane, and it is mostly unbounded. So we prefer isolated capacity management and isolated query time, so that the users do not have to pay the query time for data they do not want. So to achieve this, we will store the component logs as separate traces, which are aggregated with the telemetry object trace on demand when, the user, when we display it to the user. To be specific, we have two types of components. One type is the central controller, central controller traces. They are also stored in a centralized storage, but they have their own traces independent of the telemetry traces they retain the original format as defined by the component authors. So we do not need to modify the, these components to adapt to the telemetry format. Instead, the telemetry user, which is a downstream of the centralized controller as well as telemetry, they will maintain the configuration that interprets the structural tagging format of the component into the identifier keys, such as the object name or resource version or the audit ID. So when we display the trace, the telemetry front end can just join these traces into the object trace as required by the user. Meanwhile, node traces have even higher volume than centralized controllers. Most of the node level tracing data are actually the detailed phases of a pod's life cycle. And the pod is usually already the most common resource in a Kubernetes cluster. So these two multiplied together would generate a very huge amount of data. So to reduce the bandwidth cost as well as the cost of indexing the traces in the centralized storage, we will instead store these traces in the local, in the local file system. So we create a better DB Yaget trace storage on each node and maintain, the node will maintain its own cleanup cycle. Then when we display the trace of a node of a pod or a pod, then since we already know the node IP address, the telemetry front end can simply call the trace agent on the node to retrieve the trace directly. So now we have solved the problem of collecting the data from, for the data uh, in the spans. But there's one more piece of the puzzle to view, which is the hierarchy of the spans, or in other words, inferring the relation between objects. And in fact, in Kubernetes, there is an idiomatic indication for such relations, which is the only reference field in the metadata of each object. 
This only reference implies that the owned object is created from and controlled by the reference owner. And this automatically suggests that the owner object should be the span of the owned object. And there are also other application specific rules depending on the specific object semantics as well. For example, pods are related to the nodes they are scheduled on and the zippers they are, have to mount. Another example for ham trust is that objects managed by the same ham release should be related to each other. And in multi-cluster scenarios, the objects might also link to another cluster that controls them. For example, in the case of kip federation or kip app mode, that would be the federated object. So these are all ad hoc features that we cannot enumerate exhaustively because this depends on the, how other controllers interpret these objects. Currently, telemetry supports linking these objects by referencing the cluster kind and name of the related object in a custom annotation written by the user. And in the future, we will also support expression link, uh, an expression-based linking rule API so that telemetry can infer these connections based on the domain knowledge from the user. And similar to the component logs, the breadth and the depth of the linking relation is also unbounded. For example, when we query for the, when we query for a pod, we will link to the replica set it belongs to, and as well as the 500 other pods in the same replica set, as well as the HT nodes that these pods were scheduled to, and the other 2,000 pods that are scheduled on these nodes. So of course this is not what the user would expect the query to contain. So as a result, we have to split each object to its own separate trace as well. Furthermore, to avoid a trace from growing indefinitely, we create a new trace every 30 minutes to allow the storage to compact the old trace. So when the user queries for a pod, we just follow the object links that the user opts in to follow, like in these blue lines, and then we will also for each object, we will select the half hour traces that are intersecting with the query time range by the user. And these traces will all be merged in the front end to a single trace. Then we can finally give the user an impression of the entire choreography of an, in a single page. So this architecture allows us to support the large scale of clusters in ByteDance. Currently, we are supporting around 10 billion daily events from more than 600 clusters in a single region, and we have achieved a P99 end-to-end -end latency of around 30 sec uh, 13 seconds. And in each cluster, we deploy two instances of the calimetry controller to list watch objects together. This redundancy mechanism will prevent data loss. When the active instance writes object changes to the KV cache, and when it goes down for a few seconds, the leader, it will lose the leader list and the other instance will become active and it will flush the buffered events in the past few seconds into the KV cache. As for the audit logs, they are collected through a global audit webhook and sent through a Kafka message queue. Then the telemetry consumer will, it has 200 partitions, it will merge the audit logs with the object changes into the spans written into the trace storage. And then as we just saw, the telemetry front end, which is the uh, Yaka storage plugin, it will merge the, these traces from the audit consumer with other cons controllers and maybe the data from the node agents into a single trace and present them to the users through the Yaka UI. So this is the architecture of telemetry. And now let's look at a few applied scenarios for telemetry. So in our first case, the user created a deployment with only one replica, but their monitoring system shows that they, we have actually created many instances of the same deployment. So let's check the telemetry trace of the deployment and its tree of pods to see what happened. So first of all, we can see that the user attempted to stop this crazy pod creation at 23 minutes and this attempt was successful. There are no more pod creations after 23 minutes. But before that, there was a pod creation every five minutes. As for the created pods, the Kube controller manager did not attempt to 
do anything with them after the initial creation. It did not even try to delete or update them, even not even failed attempts. However, the replica set controller could create the pod successfully because the successful create event implies that the create request was successfully executed and acknowledged by the controller. So why does it keep creating more replicas? From the, rep from the audit log, we can see that the replica count in the replica set status never got updated, not even during the offset generation status update at uh, 23 minutes. So this rules out chances of replica set controller having an error during the status aggregation, but it implies a simply incorrect calculation of the replica status. And by design, we know that this aggregation is based on the shared pod informer cache in the kube controller manager. So this implies a possible inconsistency between the synchronous create request and the asynchronous watch streams in the kube controller manager. And another hint was the five minutes in time we just saw. So what is special about this five minute period? If we do a quick git grab from the Kubernetes source code, we will see, find this expectations timeout constant. It is the time to resync a replica set after the controller expects an update but did not receive it. So we could nail the issue. It is caused by the informer, pod informer getting out of sync. And this prompts us to check the audit logs for the kube controller manager list watch request. And eventually we discovered that there is a list timeout problem due to an oversized cluster. So the fix is simple. We simply increase the API server's request timeout limit. But this is the first case. As for the second case, we have an, so uh, some background is that we have an internal component called called cluster metrics. It is a little electric controller. So if the active instance is down, another instance will take over its work. So the responsibility of this component is to collect cluster data and write every minute into a custom resource object called cluster resource. And in this case, we are investigating an alarm revealed that the last update timestamp of cluster resource is lagging behind. So the first step, of course, is to verify that this really happened by checking the cluster resource object on telemetry. We found out that there was a pause for around 15 minutes indeed. It was a leader elected component, so why didn't the second instance take over? Then we can check the leader list trace in the, the, the trace below, and we can see all these dense vertical lines which indicate that there is an active list renewal every several seconds. So the list renewal never stopped. So the leader instance we thought to be down is actually still asserting to the entire world that it is the leader, but it is not doing any work. So if we look into the further details, there was a burst of updates request at 44 minutes, right after the period without updates. So it seems that all updates got blocked synchronously until 44 minutes. And this indicates a possible stop the world bug in the cluster matrix controller. And if we cross track the component logs of this controller, there was also a burst of logs after the silence period. So eventually all these symptoms hinted us to discover a system level problem that caused a malfunctional disk IO. So all the K log costs will hang the coroutine because the disk was malfunctional, and K-Log is a blocking operation, so all the, all the goroutines get blocked. And the leader, leader election goroutine doesn't write any logs, so it turns out the leader list did not get lost. So these are two cases of troubleshooting through telemetry. But in addition to troubleshooting, there are also other scenarios in which we can use telemetry. For example, in E2E test, we can run telemetry with the test cluster used in E2E test to record the events during the test run. So if a flaky test appears, we just need to compare the events in the successful and the failed runs to identify which step went wrong. In that case, we no longer need to retain the successful or failed test environments for debugging. We just need to compare the two traces. And running telemetry in the CI also produces a side product which is the trace of an example lifecycle in your controller. So you can use this 
example traced in your documentation to visualize the component architecture. And in fact, Kermetry GitHub repository already has a CI workflow that does exactly this. And the result is hosted on the GitHub pages, so you can scan the QR code on the right to view this, uh, this example trace through the Yager UI. This is an example of a normal deployment creation, scaling, and rollout, and upgrade rollout, and deletion. So this uses a start, setup from our quick start using a kind cluster and deploying telemetry with Docker. So if you have a Linux machine in hand and you have this installed, you can try the quick start tutorial on the, our GitHub repository yourself now, and it has a five minute tutorial to set up your local cluster to play with. As for the production usage, we also provide a Helm chart for in cluster deployment, although some manual configuration would be required to set up the audit webhook. As for the future directions, there are some features that we are planning to support in Calimetry. Uh, the first feature is the scriptable linking rules, which I have just mentioned about the part in the custom object relation semantics. And we are also planning to open source a node level component that uses eBPF to trace the actions below the kiblet level and report them to the central, uh, to join them with the telemetry output. And in the future, we can also explore the possibility to analyze this trace output using automatic diagnosis. Because the main feature of telemetry is that it extracts the relevant data in a large pool of observability data into a smaller trace. So this is a perfect input to fit into some automatic analysis tools such as some LLM models. Okay, so this is, uh, that's all for my presentation today. So any questions? Also, you can also feel free to ask in English or Chinese. Could you come a bit closer because there's no microphone in this room? I think, I think we have no microphone, so you might have to come closer. Okay, so in terms of the performance of telemetry, because we adopt a distributed architecture, so each cluster deploys its own instance of telemetry controllers with, uh, with the redundancy system I just mentioned. And in the, so the, stress for each cluster is restricted to the controller itself. And as for the global control plane, the, re the audit consumer is a, also a partitioned message queue consumer, so we can also scale out by scaling up the number of partitions. And the, so, the, so all of these are distributed and can be horizontally scalable. 我们就重复一下刚才的问题就是刚才说到一个控制面的一个数据所以如果看的是 Okay, so if you have other questions, if you don't want to ask us here, you can also find us on the CubeWolf uh, display both in the S12 in the ballroom three to four. So thank you everyone.